Well, this is my second book review of the Dark Shadows book series by Marilyn Dan Ross. However, the book is number 24 in a series of 32 novels. This was published in the waning days of the television series, December 1970. The television series finished its run on April 2, 1971. The story could have been spectacular in this book, but it, it failed in many ways, entering it into the mundane. Still, for diehard fans, it is a nostalgic romp through one of the Dark Shadows universes. There was a fairly large uh, cast of characters. Uh, however, being set in the 1870s, only two are from the TV series. Let's take a look at the main players. We begin with Professor Gerald Collins, who is an archaeologist. Our story begins on his expedition to Mexico, uh, which is concluding as we join the action. Irma Collins is the professor's daughter and the la latest in a stream of unfortunate women to fall in love with Barnabas Collins, only to be heartbroken as he sort of sneaks away at the end of the story, which, by the way, is a much overused device in this series. Then we meet the crafty Saul Hampstead, who is the attorney for the Collins family. He wants Collinwood for himself and teams with wealthy, old, and weird seaman Captain Westhaven. Westhaven is a a uh, crotchety old thing with an intense dislike for the Collinses. Now, Quentin Collins in this series of books bears very little resemblance to uh, the TV Quentin. In most of the books he is portrayed as a psychotic buffoon in my opinion. He is mean and surly and has a falling out early in this story with Professor Collins and Irma. Quentin later shows up at Collinwood as an old sailor named Jim Davis. The, the professor and uh, Irma must have been not been too observant because he fools them with his disguise. Now we also meet Stuart Jennings, who I like to believe to be an ancestor of Chris Jennings and on the uh, t from the TV show. Stuart Jennings is like is a likable young man who falls for Irma, and is left to pick up the pieces of her heart when Barnabas sneaks off, leaving only a note. Barnabas Collins, as always, arrives at Collinwood from England, where the original Barnabas settled after being forced to leave Collinsport under the vampire curse. Of course, this Barnabas is indeed the original. In this book, he has been mysteriously cured of vampirism so that he could uh, live a somewhat normal life in the daylight. A most unusual character here, and in other books, is Barnabas' uh, manservant, Hare, who is a hulking deaf mute. We never learn much about him, and he appears only briefly here. Other lesser characters are Dolores, who is a servant companion to Irma whilst in Mexico, Juan, a native of Mexico, who came to Collinwood uh, to assist Professor, and uh, Stuart Jennings' uh, father, whose first name we are uh, never told, but he appears in a, in a couple of scenes. And lastly, we have Mrs. Branch, who is a sort of devoted housekeeper at Collinwood. Both Angelique and Josette from the TV series are mentioned, but are not in the story. Also mentioned are two Collins ancestors, never mentioned on the TV show. Um, they were Josiah Collins and Abja Collins. Or is it Abja? Abja, I think. It's a strange name. Dan Ross, who wrote the book, seemed to like odd names. I spoke with him by telephone a number of times, and he was very curious about the name of the township I lived in back then, Ascoda, and I remember explaining to him in detail the story behind that name. Locations used in this book are a uh, campsite in the jungles of Mexico, Collin Wood, Collins Port, a four-masted schooner ship, the Old House, Widow's Hill, and Eagle Hill Cemetery. The back page publisher's blurb reads as follows. Professor <coughs> Ger Gerald Collins returns to Collinwood from an archaeological expedition to Mexico with several crates of animals, giant rats, poisonous snakes, and rare lizards. His daughter Irma turns to Barnabas for help. She fears her father also brought back a Quetzalcoatl, a, the terrible cursed feather serpent of Aztec mythology. Suddenly, a mysterious murder strikes at Collinwood, and the feathered serpent is reported flying over the area. The townspeople, already angered by the presence of Barnabas Collins, now demand that Professor Collins turn his specimens over to a zoo before anyone else is killed. Irma, with the help of Barnabas, tries desperately to clear his fa her father's name, and in doing so, stumbles upon a monster even more dreadful than Quetzalcoatl, um, and in quote. Interestingly, one of the unusual specimens the professor was transporting to Colin was a Demetrodon. That's right, a dinosaur-type lizard that supposedly went extinct many millions of years ago. Let's look at an encounter with that beast from Chapter 3, and I quote, 
Irma thought she would faint. Her screams were lost in the sounds of the storm. She saw her father's body lifted in the monster's mouth and shaken like a small animal. Martin made frantic proddings at the scaly beast in an effort to have it free her father, but without success. The prehistoric beast had turned all of its fury over on her unfortunate parent. Then the blast of a gun came with a faint clarity over the storm. She turned and saw Captain Oblinus standing near her with a gun in his hands. He had apparently just fired the weapon. She glanced at the Demetrodon again and saw that it had dropped to her father to the deck. The huge monster had surely been hit in some vital place, for its uh, eyes had lost their fury. A moment later, it slithered across the deck, <clears throat> and as the ship wallowed in the waves and dipped sharply to one side, the great monster went over the railings. An instant later, it vanished below the rough foam of the sea. Uh, flecked with waves. Now Martin went forward and picked up her father in his arms, end quote. Now there is a scene I'd like to have seen on television. I mean, it's pretty um, awesome, actually. Uh, I wonder how scenic designer Sai Tamashov would have orchestrated this dramatic scene with the uh, with the Demetrodon. I bet he'd have done an awesome job, though. We know from the completed uh, or complicated 1895 storyline on the on the television show exactly how Quentin fell under the werewolf curse. In this book, Dan Ross sums it up in a short paragraph. The housekeeper, Mrs. Branch, was um, explaining to Irma. She told her, Some say he had evil words spoken against him, and when the full moon comes, he can't control the devil within him. End quote. And there was a, a note of awe in the woman's uh, softly spoken words, end quote, again. In this story, we have an unusual and colorful monster by the name of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, not unknown um, in prehistory here in, uh, or in South America. At the onset of chapter 9, Irma sees the feathered serpent. And I would like to quote from you, or from that uh, encounter, that she had, and I quote, gradually um, revealed on the top of the hedge was a thing so monstrous that Irma could not conceive of anything equal to it. The body was perhaps three feet long and at least seven or eight inches thick, becoming slimmer at the head and tail. Along the uh, serpentine body were gaudy colors, uh, colored feathers extending out at least a foot, um, and the head had the uh, glistening eyes and forked tongue of a snake. The eyes of the feathered serpent caught hers, and she felt a kind of hypnosis totally holding on to her, end quote. If you've not read Barnabas Quentin and the Serpent, but intend to, I must give a spoiler alert right here. I've already told you Jim Davis was Quentin Collins in a clever disguise, but he also was uh, behind the feathered serpent. He had a mock-up of the creature that he used to terrify people. This is revealed during a night scene in the swamp as a group was out searching for the monster. How does it end? The closing scene between Stuart Jennings and Irma is quite touching. Let's take a look. And I quote from the uh, last chapter of the book. Stuart Jennings had somehow <clears throat> heard that her father was soon leaving for Africa. He came to see her one afternoon in early October. It had been several months since they had met. For a little while there was an awkwardness between them, but it passed. They walked to Widow's Hill, and there he turned to her and said, I know you were in love with Barnabas. Well, she said, his eyes met hers. I also know that I could never work out, or that it could never work out, that Barnabas has gone. I have no pride where you're concerned. I don't think pride is nearly as important as love. So I'm asking to be your second choice. And she looked up into his pleading boyish face and was touched by his frankness. And softly she said, I've always liked you. You know that. Will you be my wife, he asked. And she nodded. If you like. I can't promise undying love from this moment. But I believe I will come to love you in time. Stuart smiled. Well, we'll be happy. And he took her in his arms. But even... Uh, as their lips met, Irma had a momentary vision of a sad-faced man in the caped coat, the man she would never entirely forget, end quote. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this review. Uh, be sure to subscribe and, uh, and like so you don't miss out on my next Dark Shadows Marilyn Ross book review. Have a great evening, and God bless.